So there we go. And that's weird because it didn't um, give me a, it's recording, um, but I'm going to pretend that it's working. Um, Daniel, we have good uh, stuff on your side. Everything good? Fantastic. Fantastic. All right. Um, welcome, everybody. My name is Denise Reagan. We are here with the Garden Clubs Fun with Flowers program. Woohoo! Um, we have been doing this program for a long time. It was actually created by one of our own Garden Club members, Jan Silik, as the, the creator of Fun with Flowers. So that's pretty exciting. Um, and we've been doing it every year ever since she created it. And this one features two amazing speakers, and we'll introduce them in just a second. But my name is Denise Reagan. I'm the executive director of the Garden Club of Jacksonville. And I'm here with my colleague, Daniel Stark, who is operating all the sound and video. And um, yeah, the, is basically the, the man, the puppet behind this. It's like, he's like Oz. That's what he is. He's Oz. Um, <laughs> so we're so happy to have him. And we cannot bring programs like this to you without the help of the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund. We're so grateful to them for a fantastic grant that allows us to do programs like this and help pay for some of the technical materials you see in front of you today. And uh, our Fun with Flowers chair this year is Martha Collins Davis, and she probably checked you in. Give us a big wave back there. Hey, Martha. Big hand for Martha Collins Davis, who, you know, does so much for the garden club if i were to list all the things you would be here till tomorrow because she is super involved and we're so grateful to have her here and she's a fabulous member of the board of trustees um if you are not a member of the garden club i am required to say why not why aren't you a member of the garden club it's a good time to join because we have programs like this and there as you know there's a, a difference in price if you're a member and um, we have all sorts of really exciting things coming up and you don't want to miss out so if you're not a member check it out. There's a little um, flyer up there and it has a QR code and you can just do it right there. It takes like five seconds. Well, maybe two minutes. I exaggerate. Um, <laughs> so look that up if you would and ask us about it if you'd like. We'll tell you all about the cool stuff that we're doing. Um, and oh, the next Fun with Flowers is coming up. And if you haven't already signed up for it, do it fast. We're doing two of these because that's how popular it is. The holiday programs always are. It will be holiday decor. Jacksonville Flower Market is the one who's leading this. And so we have a morning program at 10 a.m. and an evening program at 6.30. They fill up, they completely sell out. So get your tickets while you can. It's gonna be fun. <laughs> All right, so our um, amazing speakers today, um, right around the corner from us on Lomax Street. If you haven't been to their store, it's really fabulous. You should check it out. Um, you can't go there right now. They're closed because they're here. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Alicia Palm, and I forgot to ask you, Kari, 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 thank you very much. Kari Strait, our Jacksonville natives who landed in New York City to pursue, pursue careers I can't talk today. Let me just start over. Who landed in New York City to pursue careers in design, Alicia in floral and event design, and Carrie in fashion. While the pair never met in New York City, they each moved back to Jacksonville and a chance meeting and collaboration on a local wedding encouraged the pair to partner officially. In December 2019, Alicia and Carrie opened Daughter's Flower Shop a high-end florist in Five Points, bringing together boutique floral design surfaces, specialty grab-and-go flowers, a wide-ranging selection of distinctive houseplants, and an exquisitely curated selection of home goods in an exciting and modern retail space. And I'll tell you, this doesn't do it justice because it really is all that and more. Um, so um, if you have questions, and I'm sure you will, um, because uh, some of us are a little challenged in the color theory uh, world, so, you know, Pull your questions together, save them till the end, and they'll get to that. Um, but make sure you uh, have those questions because they are they know what they're talking about. All right. Um, and with that, I am going to turn it over to Alicia and Carrie. Let's give a little applause to lead into that. Okay. Thank you so much. That is very nice. A little awkward to hear. We're excited to be here. We're Thank you for having us. Thank you, Martha, for coming in and inviting us. Um, I'm Alicia. This is Carrie. Um, we are Daughters Flower Shop. I know we're like peeking out behind the flower shop. Um, we get off, often asked, how did we come up with the name Daughters? Are we sisters? Are, you know, that's the most often question. That's pretty much it, yeah. um, no, we're not sisters. We're just friends. Uh, we wanted to really name the business something like 
Johnson and Sons, we liked the idea of flowers being sort of like an old world handcraft, but since we're not men, we thought, okay, well, we'll do something on daughters, but then we don't have a common last name. So then it kind of became and daughters and then it just became daughters. Um, we found that it works on a lot of levels since we opened the business, Carrie and I had two daughters between us and now we have four daughters between us. <laughs> um, we each have had a baby since we opened the shop, conveniently both girls. Um, <laughs> on brand. On brand. And we also love the sort of synergy of working with brides, mothers of the bride, sending arrangements to daughters from parents, from daughters to parents. So there's a lot of sort of overlapping themes and it's turned out to be just a special kind of creates like a special name for us. So that's a little bit about daughters in general. And then um, we're each going to introduce the other one for, for fun. So yeah. here's Carrie. Um, so Alicia is uh, also a Jacksonville native. Well, she lives in a few places, but she went to high school here in, um, in Jacksonville. She went to DA and then she moved to New York to study flower design where she worked under some really big floral designers in New York, the people that were sort of changing the flower look. Um, about five, six years ago, uh, now it's not 12 years ago, I guess, yeah. God. Um, Amy Merrick, Saipua, some of these really big flower names, uh, Alicia worked alongside and she really learned the craft and she also learned the art. And then she sort of developed her own style that she brought back down here. And I was lucky enough to meet her and learn from her. So our style of flower design really comes from Alicia's experience in New York. And um, I'm just was so inspired by her teaching it to me and I feel so fortunate. She um, moved back to Jacksonville. She has a wonderful husband named Thomas and two beautiful little girls, Hazel and Perry. And um, her mother is also a big part of our business. We just, our families have really become one and it's just wonderful. Mm -hmm. So um, as far as collaboration, we have um, sort of different ways of tackling things. I'm more of like jump in and get it done. Alicia's more of a thinker and it really complements, it really complements each other because sometimes I need to do a little more thinking. And um, she's an amazing problem solver and just a really organized and hardworking person. So we love working together. It's great. Thank you. Uh, Carrie is also a Jacksonville native, found her way to New York City by way of SCAD, had, has a degree in fashion worked for some notable fashion designers in New York City. We did not meet there, which is funny. Um, she did meet her husband there, who also is a Jacksonville native. <laughs> and after the two of them got married and moved back down here, um, she was sort of looking for her next creative avenue. That's when we met, this has been covered. Um, she lives in Neptune Beach. She has a four-year-old daughter and just now a three-month-old baby girl. So this is her first day back to work since the baby's been born. <laughs> Oh, thanks. <laughs> so sweet. Carrie is the sort of light and style of daughters. She's always pushing the trends forward. She's, you know, coming up with the color schemes and the sort of, I think we should do this. And this is what's trendy. And this is what that sort of fashion forecasting that she was trained to do really sort of rears its head in a good way in the shop because it's, you know, where I'm like, well, traditionally you make this using this and this. She's like, well, what if we did it with this and this? So um, like she said, it's a really good partnership. And I think that where Daughters has landed is a perfect sort of combination of the two of us combined. So we can go to the next one. Thank you. So um, just a little bit, a recap of our wedding work. When we started the business, that's all we did was events and weddings. And we really had, um, the philosophy that if we're going to do this, we want it to mean something to us and mean something to the bride. So we try to make every uh, meeting sort of over drinks, have a nice time together, get to know each other. The couples we work with, um, we love to get to know well and we stay in touch with afterwards. And they each um, have a different vision and we like to bring that to life and do something that not only have we not seen before, but something that we haven't done before. It just challenges us and it makes it more fun. So this couple, this gorgeous, drop dead, ridiculously beautiful couple, um, <laughs> Talon and Lindsay wanted this sort of 40s, beautiful, like he almost looks like a crooner, um, this like traditional, glamorous, sophisticated look. And then it was at Casa Marina, so we went tropical. And we love the way it turned out. It was just dripping with orchids and anthurium and um, really came off just right in our opinion. So, yes. um, this is a wedding we did at Congreen Pen, totally different style. As you can see, more of a farm style wedding. Uh, Lindsay really didn't know what she wanted. She wanted just greenery down the table. And we decided that um, maybe we could push it a little more. We did these olive topiaries because they grow olive at Congreen Pen. And she gave us the best compliment we can hear, which is we gave her what she didn't even know she was looking for. So we love to, we love to just kind of really dig in and figure out what it is that would make, um, make it really sing of the couple themselves who's getting married. And then this is a more recent um, 
kind of a more trendy color palette. Uh, we've had this transition as everyone to the sort of micro wedding. So this was a little mini wedding, um, but none, none less beautiful and just as, um, just as many flowers. And actually, I think it's kind of fun to make a small wedding just ridiculously floral. It just makes it a lot of fun and it makes it feel special. Um, to a couple who's kind of been through a lot, you know, at this point, everybody's had to postpone and um, we've all been through the ringer. So it's a fun way to make it really pop. Um, thanks so much. This is a classic. Oh, I love this one. Um, this is a really beautiful, classic uh, Christmas wedding. This was one of the first we did together. I think it's actually been a few years, but as you can see, it doesn't age because it's just this idea of this gorgeous Dutch bountiful um, centerpiece with big red peonies. And you know, a gorgeous bride and gorgeous bridesmaids doesn't, doesn't hurt. hurt. Yeah, so uh, that's a little a little micro example of our wedding work. And now Alicia will tell you a little bit more about our shop work. So in December of 2019, we thought let's take this idea of what we're doing with the weddings and sort of pivot to the everyday as well. And we loved this idea of sort of opening a brick and mortar, joining the, the non um, small business community, kind of being able to get to know the people and be with them a little bit longer because something we love is getting to know these brides, but then once they're married, we stop dealing with them, we stop seeing them. So we thought, you know, what we love so much is connecting and telling these stories. So if we open the shop, we can do that with people on a weekly basis, on a daily basis for birthdays, et cetera. So um, we do all of the traditional flower shop things. We do daily deliveries. We do special events in your home at venues, weddings, funerals. We run the gamut, but we try to do it with a sort of modern twist. So um, right in five points, you can come see us. We have the all the like, you know, little candles and accessories for sale as well. If you're looking for holiday decorating, I am obligated to pitch that we will do that for you. <laughs> so um, let us know what you need. We'll come hang your garland and trim your trees. Um, but yeah, so it's the same idea of storytelling, twisting traditions, sort of modernizing something sort of old world and making it new again, and just getting to know you all in a single little stem bud base or at a huge wedding. It doesn't matter to us. It's still just that sort of connecting with nature, connecting with the community. And that's what we love to do. So that was the idea of Daughters, the shop. Um, we didn't really, couldn't have predicted did COVID or the timing, but um, we opened in December 2019. Yeah, and then closed in March, <laughs> um, reopened in July, finally. And then as many of you probably know, they shut our street down. Lomax was under construction for about a year. So we are finally back open and in full bloom. So please come <laughs> and see us. Um, we need all the support we can get. So um, yeah, you can see all of our offerings on our website and you can make your deliveries uh, orders right through the website and everything like that too. So today what we really wanted to get into in terms of the arranging was this idea of color theory. This is sort of a, just a taste of a very large and broad category, but that the idea that we all know about primary colors, red, yellow, and blue, probably have heard of secondary colors, which is when you mix the primaries together. So red and blue make a purple, which is a secondary. Um, blue and yellow make green, that's your secondary. And no, orange, uh, orange. Um, yellow and red make orange, that's your secondary. To push that out even farther, then you get to tertiary, which is when you mix a primary with a secondary. And so that is when you would mix orange and red, you get something more like this burnt orange or when you mix um, you know red and purple together you get a, like a deeper sort of magenta so that's the idea of the three categories of the colors we like to talk a lot about color theory because we find that the colors that we choose and the way we use them in the arrangements is a thing that really sets them apart so when you see a sort of traditional centerpiece has kind of a color palette maybe it's pastels for spring and it's pink and yellow and purple and a little bit of you know, peach and blue and this, and it's sort of everything all in the vase everywhere. We sort of call that like a potpourri arrangement, which is still beautiful and special. But what we try to do is really hone in on these color theory basics to sort of modernize the look of that a little bit. Um, what we like when we were talking about doing this presentation and what we thought, you know, well, what would our theme be and what would we talk about? We sort of realize that this is the thing that we spend a lot of time talking about together when we make our palettes for weddings or um, in the shop each week, we don't have any kind of wire service. So what we do is we just go to the market each week and we select the color palette that we wanna work with. 
And then like sort of how you see it in front of you, we will buy it like this for the week. And then when people call to order, we say, oh, we have, we're offering sort of this designer's choice this week. Obviously for some, you know, we can make specified, you know, a, some sympathy custom, thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, she's turning 16 and it's all pink. Can you do all pink? Yes, of course. But, um, you know, we try to kind of stick to a palette each week. And this is that same idea again of sort of taking that what's sort of traditional for wedding work and special events and kind of turning that on its head to make that more of like an everyday kind of luxury. So um, the color theory really works to bring together the sort of science and beauty of colors and how they work together. And that's really what we feel sort of really is harmonious with flowers themselves. They're both a sort of biolog biological scientific element, but they're also so ephemeral and beautiful. And so we thought color theory was kind of an interesting way to talk about them. So here we have primary, secondary, tertiary, and that's your color wheel. Um, go to the next slide. So when you talk about um, designing colors together and how they work together. There's three schools, or not three schools, three um, three basic designs that you can use, complementary, analogous, and triadic. This is just um, something that's a go-to that's always gonna work. So complementary means that they are exact opposites on the color wheel. So wherever you turn that line on the color wheel, think of it as a dial that you can turn. Um, any two colors that are opposite each other are complementary. And what that means, it's not necessarily that they're gonna be harmonious, it's that they're gonna really vibrate. So when you put those colors next to each other, each color will appear stronger, more vibrant, and your eye, like the human eye gets drawn to that. So if there were, um, you know, a gator flag, let's say a blue and, uh, sorry, orange and blue gator flag hanging over there, all of our eyes would go to it because those are complementary colors. So Christmas is a really good example, um, red and green. So that's the kind of like holiday colors, things that really draw your eye, those tend to be complements. Um, a lot of sporting, sport teams use those too. Um, an analogous color scheme is any three colors. Um, we can even stretch it broader than that. It could be five, six colors, but that sit next to each other on the color wheel, and that's going to create harmony. So you could, again, turn the style and these three little triangles anywhere that three are sitting side by side. You put those three colors together, and it's going to feel easy. It's going to make you feel relaxed. It's going to have a harmonious feel. Um, the triadic color theory is you sort of take this triangle in the middle of the dial, and that's where you turn your color wheel, and you get these three colors that aren't quite complementary, aren't quite analogous, but they tend to just sit well together. Um, a lot of that sort of like traditional shop flower work would have that kind of a color scheme. What we're playing with today is sort of a blend of the two, of the first two. So we're gonna do an analogous color scheme because in, flo in flowers, that's what you get. You could order the same peach rose with the same name two weeks apart, two years apart, and it's gonna to look totally different. You're never gonna have the exact shade. It might be close, um, but you could also say, I wanna order a peach palette to your wholesaler or to, uh, you could go to the market and look for peaches and you're gonna get all these different shades of peach. So naturally flowers are analogous. Naturally, when you put shades together, they're gonna to have that feel. And then what we do is we spike a complementary tone against it and we create this sort of ombre. So that's what we're gonna be making today is a sort of ombre arrangement with pops of contrast to make each color look brighter more vibrant and um, to move your eye within the arrangement. Um, on the color wheel, you can see that it's divided in half with warm and cool colors. Um, you may notice that around this time of year, warm colors are the norm. Everybody loves um, autumnal, you know, burnt oranges and these sort of corn stalk, you know, wheat color, yellows, all those are warm colors. So in the shop, when we do fall, um, what we like to do is sort of pop something pastel in the mix and that creates vibrancy and it moves your eye and it also just makes it a little more modern. Um, so that's kind of what we're gonna be playing with today as well. A little bit of fall, a little bit of pastel and um, a lot of vibrant contrast. And then when you mix, this is the final color theory sort of principle. Um, you take any of those tertiary, I'm sorry, um, yeah, tertiary colors, you mix either white, gray or black and you get tints, tones and shades. And those really are where you get into flowers. Um, nothing is, most things aren't going to be like pure bright primary red. You're going to have um, softer mauves, you're going to have berries, you're going to have all these different variations with um, muted blush tones. And that's really- well, Like you can show even just looking yeah. at this. This is purple, you know, but it's not purple. It's a lot of shades of purple. This has more red in it, so it's mauvey. This is a real lavender tint, so it has white in it. This is a, I would say a shade, so it has black in it because it's a deep, deep purple. So all these variations um, come into play when you're playing with flowers. And now taking that color theory idea, we're going to show you practically how to create an arrangement that connects 
that uses color theory to make an arrangement look really special and modern. Yeah. Do you want me to run through these slides first and then do the arrangement or do them at the same time? Um, I would run through them first. Do it first and yeah. then so you get it like twice. Okay, so when we talk about the base composition, just getting a little um, room. Oh, okay, um, we sort of break it down into five categories, and this is the way. This isn't necessarily to say that this is the only way to do it, but this is the way that I think it tends to be the easiest in terms of when you're putting things in the vase, saving room for the bigger things, or sometimes you get to where you. I sometimes will put like the thing I like the most in first, and then sometimes I think, oh, I haven't saved enough room, and then I have to sort of like crawl through and like cram in. So if I'm being measured and good, I will follow my own advice. And I, um, this is the best way I think to get the sort of most value out of your space. Um, so I usually start with greenery and that's very obvious and common. Um, and I think I'm just gonna talk about it first and then do it, yeah. So first we um, start with what we call the green, well, what is called greenery that in this Today, we're using three different kinds of greenery. We're using this, which is an eucalyptus variety called Agonis. Um, we're using a sort of more typical, just sort of flat greenery called Huckleberry. And then we've got some Limonium, which has a little bit of a flower to it. Um, so uh, I personally love greenery and I would like to just sometimes do a greenery arrangement and stop there. I think it can be so beautiful and textural and, um, I try to always, whenever I teach anyone, I say, if your base can go out with just greens, then that's the, then you know you have the right base. And the flowers really are only just kind of the extra, the like bow, the ribbon on the top. So from the greens, we move on to the bread and butter flowers. That's, you know, of course, what I call them as well. Um, I don't, sorry, are we going to put the, yeah, I don't I wasn't sure. <laughs> yeah, let's put those up. Yeah, this is perfect. Okay, so from, um, from the greens, we go to the flowering filler, and that would be um, anything, if you're familiar with like wax flower, baby's breath, uh, those kinds of really small sort of, it's really just filler, but it has just a little something extra. And um, again, we're always, along with this sort of idea of like challenging ourselves to do something different, we're always like, really like just trying to pack as much texture in these arrangements as we can because to me that's a, the difference between something looking really luxe and expensive and something looking always still beautiful like of course the big asterisk on this is that no matter what you do the flowers are beautiful right but this is the thing that can kind of make it just look a little bit like wow I never really thought to put that in there and you know part of that is playing with these textures and that's sort of breaking that greenery into those two categories. Um, the third one is the bread and butter flowers. That's what you would call, like you would consider your snapdragons, your stock, your carnations. Um, a lot of the sort of standard varieties or things that you see uh, readily available, those are what would make up the kind of bulk of your arrangement, fill it in. This is the stock. You know, you can see a lot of times the bread and butter is the biggest in size value. So it takes up the most space in the base. Um, this would be one of the bread and butter flowers. Um, I'm trying to look at what we're working with today. The mini carnations, these would be the bread and butter flowers. So, you know, when you look at this stem, you see that there's multiple heads on a single stem, you know, that's going to sort of fill your vase and take up a lot of real estate. So that's sort of what you're looking for with this uh, bread and butter category. The next category that we like to talk about is called a face flower. That would be your roses. Um, your dahlias, those would be um, anything that you're really, that has like a round head basically that you're really kind of featuring. So if it, the season calls for it, those are, would be your peonies. Um, that would be, what else do I have in there? Hydrangeas, you know, just really kind of what it sounds like, a, a big face of flowers. Um, and then the last thing is what we call like our gestural element. And so we'll use ranunculus a lot. That's my personal favorite. Um, we will use these, the scabiosa. It's anything that has kind of like a long stem and just is gonna be that finishing touch to kind of continue the line that you're creating with the arrangement and let your eye kind of wander. We like this idea and always talk a lot about like, how do we, we like to arrange flowers. So when you see them in the vase, they evoke the, na the natural product that they are. And so letting these sort of gestural pieces kind of pop up is a nice way to kind of call back to how they're grown and what they really look like in, out in, in nature. Um, 
a good rule of thumb for a gestural flower, tulips is one, ornamental grasses, um, is something that the stem is almost as pretty to look at as the flower itself. So you wouldn't really feature something like, um, let's see if I can get this out without knocking it over. You know, you wouldn't really feature this because you're kind of like, this is a lot to look at, it's pretty bulky or whatever. So this compared to this, you can see that this is probably more in your bread and butter category, and this is more going to be your gestural flower. So if you're, you know, shopping for flowers and you're looking, tulips can be a really beautiful one because they're just that little last touch that kind of adds like some arch to the to the vase or some something drooping. It's just sort of that little last, it's like you know, putting those earrings on the outfit. It's just the last little touch. That's the gestural flowers. Ready? This is just an example of how we use them in the vase. So um, this sort of, this graphic will kind of, each one is highlighted. And then as we go, you'll see the full thing come together. So here you can see the greens at the base. The flowering filler gets added in next. Then comes the bread and butter. And you can see, each step it's adding a little bit more like bulk to you know um, value and in, in terms of space to the vase. Um, next comes the face flowers and then uh, last comes the gesture and those this was a little actually a graphic of an arrangement that we made in the store and then Carrie was able a computer wizard I don't know she made this whole thing I don't I just, like, can't believe it honestly so um, so that's sort of how it all works together. And then I think there's one more, right? Is that, yeah, so this shows it all together. And I sort of crudely put the numbers on there. Um, you know, number one there, you can try to search through and find the greenery. That's then the face flower, uh, the flowering fillers buried in there, the bread and butter, the face and the gesture. And so, you know, we'll hear tonight us talk about this a lot. And this is sort of where we're going with that. At your stations, we have created the recipe for what we're working with, and I've put them actually in order of the way that we would recommend you put them in the base. Um, so I'm going to do that now, and you can get a sense of that um, as well. So does anyone have any, can I ask our questions now or not yet? Does anyone have any questions for us? Yes. So we do that. And if you of, don't mind, could you repeat the question just so we can get oh, that sure, on sure. the recording? The question, yeah, the question was like, are we um, counting the stems, right, as we go? So are we thinking it in a numerical way, like seven face flowers, three bread and butter, like that, right? Um, yes, we do. We do that math ahead of time, usually. So at this point, we know in the shop, like we have the um, bases that we sell at different price points. So it's kind of intuitive now. I think it's probably, I don't, play the piano, but I'm assuming it would be like, at first you're like notes and learning and doing it. And then once you learn, you just play. So now we don't really do that. We kind of can just tell how much it is the right amount, but it is the way we do all of our ordering. Yes. And it's the way that we write the recipe. It's the way I did this recipe tonight. So, you know, thinking about the, and it always changes depending on the vase that you're using. Sometimes it's a miss too. Like if you've never used this vase before, you think, oh, definitely five roses for this. And then you're making it and it really only needs three. So it, there's a lot of sort of guesswork in terms of how much it's going to take. And to Carrie's point about the sort of um, variable of how the product comes in, you know, these dahlias, they are this big today. Next time we order them, they could be this big. So I could order three for the vase and then only one fits in. So there really isn't any prescribed correct number. It's sort of just what's best for the shape of the container. Yes. We do try to work in odd numbers and, um, you know, do we work in odd numbers is the question. And, you know, there is that thing that people widely say that odds are more pleasing to the eye because there's a center and then flanks. And that is definitely true. Um, the exception that we make for that is that we will use a pair of something especially in like a container like this, like you'll see a lot of twos on your, on your sheet tonight. But the difference would be that we would use them where if you had odd numbers, you would do them in, you know, maybe like threes like this. Well, if you take this away, but you're still using these on separate planes, you kind of get that same look versus that where you have like this, you know, antenna effect, which is not what we're looking for. Um, so as long as you're using them on different planes, we find that the, an even number is okay. Is there another question? Yes. There is no oasis in this. 
tonight we've pre-taped the base for you. So it has a tape grid on the top. Yeah, we, we work really hard not, you know, to use as little as we can um, for environmental reasons, but uh, some bases just still call for it and there's no real, there isn't anything better to use. There are a couple of Oasis products coming out on the market now that are made with wool and they are, you know, more sustainable and can be sort of wrung out and reused. Um, I have not personally used them yet. They're obviously way more expensive. So, you know, getting that bride to commit to that sustainable wedding, isn't, <laughs> we're not quite there yet, but um, no, no Oasis in this. We try not to use any in the shop. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Right, great question. Do we leave the stems that have multiples? Those little multiples on a stem are called laterals. So do we leave the laterals on the stem and use it each time as, as completely as one? The answer to that is absolutely not. Um, you have the power to use the stem however you want. So, you know, I remember like one of my first teachers telling me, don't be afraid to cut off what you don't want. And you have this idea that, okay, well, here's the stem. It's so beautiful, right? You don't wanna cut it. You don't wanna waste it. Like I couldn't possibly just take these three, but you do, you have to. So what you try to do is be really conscientious about where you cut it. So if you cut it at all the low points and you're thoughtful about that, you can get a lot of use out of it. So where a recipe, maybe this recipe calls for, you know, five stems of this, you might only need to use two because you've been able to cut it apart so much. And yeah, I mean, but you have to remember that ultimately, you know, even if you're making this and it really just needs one, like now you have all these little ones, you can put them in a vase by themselves, they can go in a little bud vase. Um, you can put them smaller in this arrangement in other places. Um, a lot of times we really try to watch what I call the collar of the arrangement, which is just where the lip of the vase starts and stops and where the flowers begin. And a lot of times you'll see people put the flowers in and there's this like long area of just stem there, which is just a personal pet peeve of mine. So a lot of times with these little leftovers, I'll just stick them right in. So you have a like a blossom sitting right there on the cuff. And it's such a good little trick to, to kind of just fill in that space. So that's a good way to use the cutoff ones. Um, but my grandmother used to say, it owes you nothing. And that's basically what you keep in mind about these. It really doesn't, you don't, you're in charge of how you cut them. And as long as you're sort of thoughtful about where you cut it, it's very little waste from it. Yeah, good question. Yes. Yes, do you line the lip with greenery instead of flowers? The answer is yes, you, you would do that first. Like I was saying, you wanna sort of fully create the scale, the shape, everything with your greens first. But sometimes you, you are left with you know this little thing. And it's my feeling that instead of putting it in the trash, kind of sticking it in there to fill that gap, to me, this is more pleasing to look at than this. So I would just rather, I mean, if I've got this, I'm gonna stick it in. I wouldn't necessarily cut anything specifically that short to put it there, but if you've got it, might as well use it. Yeah, anything else? Questions? Okay, great. So I, I'm gonna get started with this. I'm gonna first start using this huckleberry. This is just a shrub, as you can see. It's very um, sturdy, it's very hardy. Uh, some of it, you know, when it comes in, I, we are always like on the lookout, you'll see little spots where it's been munched or there's, you know, little, um, <laughs> there's some dirt on it or something. So, you know, we're always looking for, for that to, sometimes it's pretty, sometimes it just looks, you know, truly munched. So we have to watch out for that. Um, so again, here's sort of that question about, do you cut it down or do you use it as one? So obviously, if I were to cut this to fill the vase, and this goes back to the numbers question as well, how many pieces of greenery is it gonna take? Well, you can see from this how different each piece of greenery is. So you think, oh, I th maybe it'll be three pieces, but if I cut this down and I'm smart about it, I may be able to use just one to fill this vase. So, um, you know, good rule of thumb is always to look at where the 
piece naturally bows and that that's a good place to cut. Um, you also always want to keep in mind, use the pieces to their to the advantage that they're presenting. So this piece is naturally skewing this way. So I'm gonna put this in my vase so that it's naturally going in the direction it's already facing. It would be sort of silly to kind of try to make it do something it's not doing. Um, so you want to keep that, and that's really kind of true for all the flowers, but especially true for the greenery because this greenery, especially in a container like this without the oasis, it will just, sort of start coming out on you. But if you can sort of put it in, in its own direction, and then what I like to do is make a sort of bird's nest um, as I'm putting it in. So I'll cross all the stems in the vase like this. And then now I've already got sort of this is kind of holding itself up on its own because you've put it in in the way that it wants to be. Um, it, it will be less likely to fall out onto itself. Um, something I was going to say. Oh, you know what we like to use in the shop, which I didn't bring today. I don't have 35, but we use a lazy Susan. And so we'll put the flowers in the lazy Susan. And a nice rule of thumb is to think about the clock, 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, and 9 o'clock. And so I try to find a piece that's pointing to 12 o'clock. I put that in. I spin it to 3. I put one in there. I spin it to 6. I put one in there. I spin it to 9. I put one in there. And you keep building it that way. And that sort of helps with the collar as well. Like you, then you know you have everything kind of covered. Then you can kind of rotate it and then do that over and over again until you're full all the way. Um, so I'm going to just start putting this in that now that you sort of know what I'm going to be doing. Um, tape grid is a really good thing. You can use scotch tape. You can buy floral tape at a craft store. You can buy it from Daughter's Flower Shop. Um, it's not really necessary. It could be any kind of tape. You can also take a piece of chicken wire and as long as you're not using a clear vase but if you have any kind of opaque vase like this you can ball up some chicken wire and put that in and that works like a flower frog as well um, so without you know I'm gonna I'm gonna have to say say what I do what I say not what I do because now I'm like thinking am I doing this at 12 am I doing this at six oh the stripping yeah thank you so another good sort of rule of thumb is to um, make sure that you're stripping everything below the line of the vase. So as you put this in, if I'm gonna leave it like this, rather than put this all in there, you wanna strip it clean. Some of this stuff, if, you, if you're cutting greenery from your yard especially, you wanna take a sharp, like a paring knife and kind of um, score the stem kind of peel that first layer off because that's really dirty and so that will sort of cloud your water so if you just kind of uh, peel i guess that first layer of bark to where the stem looks more uh, fresh then that's a good way to keep the, the water cleaner longer so you know giving you longer base life um, the stripping is your best friend i mean a lot of people will ask us like do you need to put preservatives in the water? Do you need to use flower food? Do you need to drop a penny in there? What about Sprite? What about bleach? Um, no, the answer is none of that. Really, it's just about keeping the water clean. So if you know that you're gonna be able to clean the water daily or every other day or whatever, you know, I would say every other day, probably at the least, then you don't need the penny, you don't need the flower food. Um, all of those things are just keeping you, keeping the vase from creating bacteria, which is from the leaves and from the dirt on the stem. So keep the water changing. And if you've got something like this with the tape grid, it's kind of hard to change the water. So um, a good way to do that is to take the sprayer on your kitchen sink and just take this, stick the sprayer in under the tape and just let it fully flow out and refill. And that's the way you can refresh the water with the tape on it. Um, let's, let me get another piece of that. Oh, perfect. Oh, perfect. Okay. So I would say this is about, I'm not sure, 65% full and just, I'm just making that up, but you know, I, it's not quite there yet. I would like to see a little bit more coverage inside before I move on to the next um, element. 
So, ma'am? <laughs> well, I, I think that that's one of the sort of things that we really, it really is a key to our designing is that you wanna get this full. Like I said, you want to be able to send this out the door and like acceptable for delivery with just greenery. And it is um, a way to really ensure that the flowers take the shape that you want them to have. And that it just, again, creates that texture and creates something that looks luxe and impactful in a kind of easy, easy way. I mean, this is some of the, these greens are like one of the cheapest elements that you're arranging with. So why not really go for it with the greenery? And then it's like, hey, you're halfway there already. So, this also is the time that you really have the opportunity to determine the shape of your vase. So more than any other time, it's like how people say salt the pasta water, because that's the only time you'll be able to really season the pasta. That's true of the creating the shape as well. So now we can see, okay, I've created this opportunity for me to go this way. I've created an opportunity for me to go up like this with the flowers. I've created a little hole here for the flowers to go. On this side, same thing, there's a little area. So the greenery is like the best indication of where your flowers can go. Uh, that's another reason to put a lot in there. It gives you a lot of opportunities. Um, next, I'm going to use this limonium. Going back to the sort of way that we organize the filler versus the flowering filler versus the bread and butter, there's a lot of crossover. So nothing is like a tried and true bread and butter only, flowering filler only. This is an example. This would be sort of a flowering filler. It could also be your greenery. You know, it's sort of everything is sort of, you're beholden to nature, right? Like what's available that day. So even if you don't have as much green greenery that you wanted, that's okay. This can stand in for it. Or maybe you're really going for like a purple, purple explosion. And so you don't want to use any greenery. That's going to take away from it. So you can use this as your greenery completely or no greener at all. But, um, you know, this, what we're demonstrating tonight is kind of just like the sort of signature. So now with this flowering, did I make it? No, you can tell when you know. Um, now with this next layer of greens is where you sort of can really start implementing that shape. So I'll probably put this in all the opposite places where I've already put the green greenery. So in comes this purple now to kind of fill in for the spots that I left a hole for. Using the greenery is also where you set the like high point of your arrangement. So now that I have this in here, I know I'm not gonna put anything higher than this. This gives me my whole like plane of design. Now I know exactly where I'm going with everything else. And again, you don't have to have that in there, but I that helps me visualize and it helps me realize how much product I need to use um, to sort of set my parameters and then you know color in the lines from there. Does anybody have any questions? No. Okay. I should probably stop talking and start arranging. Let's see. What's next? The Adonis. The other thing to sort of take note of that I'm doing a little bit differently is that I'm leaving this center sort of low and empty. Um, that's another thing that we like that we feel looks more natural is to have that negative space left in there rather than rounding this out, which is a more typical way to do it. So this looks to me more like something you'd see in nature, something that's a little bit more interesting to the eye, something that like Carrie was saying with the colors, this helps move your eyes. So if this was all filled in here, you kind of just look at it and then that's all there is to look at. But you start here, your eyes gonna wander down here. Oh, there's nothing there. Let me move on over to here. It's just sort of a little subtle way of creating some movement in the base. So we will always try to do that sort of like high and low kind of, um, play, you know, play with that. And then to that, to that end, when you create negative space, it gives you a great opportunity to stick something in it, right? So now we have another, yet another layer that we can incorporate and another sort of textural element, another way to call back to the uh, color palette that we're using. And again, like I really try to challenge myself to make 
the arrangement is presentable on greens alone, because you know that if you've done that, adding flowers is only going to make it better. Yes. Yes, is there a rule of thumb about how much the ratio, right, between the flowers to the vase? Yes, there is. Great question. Um, it's two thirds. So you want to have of the total composition, two thirds of the total from the table to the top are flowers and one third is vase. And that's how you always know that your scale is going to be perfect. Sometimes you'll see like a big urn and then there's just like a little kind of thing sitting on top and you're thinking something about that is kind of weird. Well, what's weird about that is the scale is just like totally off. So if your vase is this big, your thing needs to be like that much bigger. So yeah, that two thirds to one third is the best rule of thumb. That's a good question. Um, so, okay, I think I'm almost there with this. And, you know, we were saying that we think this is the best way to put things in the vase. It, it's true, but that doesn't mean that at the end you're like, you know what, it really just needs one more piece of that greenery. Let me shove that in. You know, obviously you can always go back. You can add to it as you go. Sometimes little holes present themselves that weren't there before, and you can fill them in with things that you've already, you know, used before and moved on from. Um, I, I do, like I said, I do like to leave some empty space because that gives you the opportunity to go back and really highlight some other elements because they have this like space all their own. I will say something to notice too is that when you're creating the vase arrangement, you really want to put something in on a true like horizontal, if you can, like this piece. Without this piece, it's still nice. But this is just a little bit nicer, you know, in terms of that scale, that two thirds to one third. This kind of creates that frame. So it helps with that lip issue. It helps with, you know, giving your eye like the full frame. I know it, it's hard to get that into every vase, but if you keep, this is a good thing to do that with. You want to look for something like this that has a really flexible stem so that you can manipulate it to be sort of going it at an angle and kind of finding the water. Um, that's another good thing for using the chicken wire or the tape, because this is allowing me to like lay things kind of almost flat in there. And then the tape is supporting it like kind of across the vase and down into the water. Um, okay, so I'm just checking for holes. Um, I would encourage you all to make your arrangements on a, up on a level, sometimes like we'll turn a bucket over or at home I'll use two vases and I'll turn one vase over and stick it on the top. It's a lot easier to be looking at it a little elevated than like looking down on it. You don't miss as many holes that way. Um, okay, so I'm gonna move on from the greenery to now the bread and butter and I'm going to use three stems of this stock. Um, are you familiar with this flower? It's, a, it's like an old school flower shop special. It's so fragrant, it smells like cloves. It's so beautiful. It comes in a variety of colors, this pastel purple. It comes in like all purples, red, uh, pinks, yellow. I think that's it. And, you know, various shades. Um, my mom talks about when she always would visit her grandmother, she would go to a flower shop each visit and they would walk in. And she, when I first started doing flowers, she would come around and be like, oh my God, that smell, I sm that's the smell of, the flower shop from my childhood, it has a very distinctive smell. We try to use it in every arrangement for that reason to kind of create that like sense memory. And uh, it's it's one of our favorites. It's like, if you see it, grab it, it's so good. So um, once we start with the flowers is where we're gonna really try to start working on this color palette idea. So having said that, putting the stock in for this recipe, we're gonna use three pieces and we're gonna concentrate them in a single area. So where you might like put one, two and three in and be like, great, this to get this sort of ombre color theory effect, I'm gonna to stick to one side where I think that I'm gonna just declare this the purple side. So put it, this one, stock, S-T-O-C-K, yeah. And it get, I think it gets overlooked because when people talk about it, they think you're just talking about your stock. Like, oh, what are you stocking today? Yeah, it's easy to sort of misunderstand. So it's such a beautiful one. Um, so I'm gonna, and, and this is the one like with that lip issue, this one looks so beautiful dripping out, right? It's like grapes or something. So 
you want to kind of, again, play to its own strengths, use it dripping out of the vase. That's what it's begging for. You know, this is just like, what could be prettier than that? And this is something that I would, is a good example of like, you just don't want to feature this. Don't do it, you know, cut it down as short as you want to, because you don't need to look at this. You really need to look at this. Um, another thing that makes, reminds me to say is that a lot of flowers like this that have clusters, like gladiolas is one, snapdragons is another stock. Don't be afraid to cut these things off at the very top. They're never going to open in the base. And what they do is they draw water all the way up. This stuff will die faster because more effort is going to the top, which is never going to open before it dies. And some will, like, do you see this one? That might open, but this definitely never will. And what it's going to do is just pull this down, and it's more likely to snap here before it before its life ends because we've left this on. So again, as long as you're sort of conscientious about it, I always cut things off at an angle, make it look like a finished point. Still looks lovely, but you're not drawing that energy from these little things. And you'll get a little, little more base life out of it. Um, okay, so here's my stock in my vase. This is now emerging as my purple side. And this kind of goes to the idea of the evens and the odds. This is like a cluster of three. We try to cluster the things together, whether they're even or odd, because again, it's more sort of pleasing to the eye and that's more how it appears in nature. Um, so once we've got the stock in, I'm gonna add the delphinium, which is here, this lovely, lovely blue. Same thing with this. This is another one that, you know, you've got these laterals on here. I will cut these off and then potentially top, you know, just stick them back in in a little spot if I need to. These could be your little gestural pieces because they have such little cute movement and, you know, little sweet sweetness to them. They could go really nicely in a bud base. Um, these will not, no. I know, no. They won't. Um, you can really kind of tell by how hard they are um, pretty much with very few exceptions, kind of when it's cut, it's done. It doesn't usually typically open very much more after that. So like I said, every now and then one that's really like kind of on its way already, it, it might, but you kind of shouldn't count on it. And I, I personally would rather preserve what is already good. So that's sort of our method. Um, you know, I'm gonna take this one off even though I hate to see it go. Um, we use this blue a lot kind of no matter the arrangement because we find that this blue in particular is just so beautiful and pleasing and it makes no matter what you put it next to just makes everything look better I don't know I mean something about it <laughs> it's just really nice with everything it works so well I was going to say it's our branding we've decided to do our branding in this color for that reason so like our card is that color blue it just really pops nicely yes this is delphinium and it, all of this is on your sheet too. I've written it all out for you on the sheet. Um, it come, I know it comes with um, these beautiful, it comes in this beautiful light blue. It comes in a more dark, like cerulean blue, um, comes in white, comes in lavender, that's it. But in nature, they grow in like big stalks. It's very gorgeous. And there's nothing that isn't better when you stick delphinium in it. So this delphinium we're using as a sort of bridge between the oranges and the purples. So with that color scheme in mind, since I've sort of designated this as the purple side, I'm gonna think about this more as like the orange side. And then I'm gonna try to put the things in working my way from one to the other. I'm gonna use this as sort of like a, one of the bridge flowers. So also because of its shape, I'm gonna keep it a little bit higher because this is the thing that I really kind of wanna feature. And like I said, once I put this in, I knew that I wasn't gonna go higher than that. So that's probably where I'm gonna let it stop. And then maybe as I finish, I might cut it down a little bit or I might go back, but you know, once you cut, you can never go back. So I always try to keep things a little longer um, at first. When you're arranging flowers, it's the hardest lesson to learn is how short to cut things. And you'll, when you first start, you're like, it takes you twice as long to make an arrangement because you cut something, you put it in, you take it back out, you cut it again, you cut something else, you put it back in. Um, the more you do it, the more you just get sort of like muscle memory for it. Like, I'm just looking at you, I'm just gonna cut it, I'm not even gonna look. And then I just stuck it in and it's just the right size, but that just comes with doing it over and over and over again. 
it has really very little to do with skill and a lot to do with practice. So um, just keep that in mind. Um, okay, so also on the purple side, and I'm, I'm sort of going to go off script a little bit here, I think. Let me see. No, 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 not yet. Okay. Um, so next comes these mini carns. This is still what we're considering the uh, bread and butter. I love these things. We are very loud and proud carnation fans. I know not everybody is, um, but carnations are really getting more and more interesting. They're really trying to um, create more and more beautiful color combinations. They're they're coming now with like fancy petals with you know little ruffle on them. They're um, one of the few flowers that does provide as many color varieties as it does. It's like one of the best sort of easily manipulated colors. So they're able to produce them in a lot of different colors. They're also so cheap and they're so hardy that uh, every florist has to love them. You know, they never die. They cost 40 cents a stem. They're perfect, right? I'm with you on, if you're not a carnation fan, I get it from the red. I get it for those dyed green ones. I get the baby pink you know, like, yes, but the, they can be so special. And so do we have the other color? Oh yeah. Um, perfect. This one's called apple tea. Um, it's just such a really beautiful shade of peach kind of evokes a ballet slipper. Um, it, when you look closely at yours, you'll see it has like a little pink stripe in it. They're, they're just becoming so interesting that you kind of, I, I would really encourage you to open yourself up to them if you're not already a fan. The other thing I'm going to show you is this little trick, which you may know to peel the neck here, just kind of gently go in there, peel that little neck back, encourage her to open. And then she really almost looks like a camellia. She looks like a rose not your grandmother's carnation. Please, we love carnations. We get orders all the time, no carnations. And we're like, okay, well, you're lost. We love them. Um, so, okay, I'm putting these mini carns in. They're a real workhorse. Again, we really love them. And so you can see that this is purple. I know. How about now? There we go. You can see this is, you know, purple, definitely akin to purple, but it has a little more warmth to it. It has a little more pink. It has a little, you know, a, it's a little mauvey. It's like moving towards these oranges. So this is another one that I'm going to use as a bridge. And with those, see, this is, I just cut this from all one stem. And what I might do is hold like one little one back. So something I like to do is sort of put I worked in the shop for this really eccentric woman and she called it a beauty mark, which I thought was kind of funny. So she would, you know, if she was making some arrangement of like, oh, a bunch of these roses, then she would add this and that would be its beauty mark, you know? And so I kind of think about that and I think, okay, well, once we get to the orange side, it might be kind of nice to save these little ones and maybe you can put those in to kind of connect back to the like more true purple side. So I'm going to put this aside as well. Um, let's see, after the mini carns, then we're, we're going to put the actual carnations in. And like I said, we really, they're the true workhorse of the shop. They open to be so big, so they, you can really get a lot out of them. This is a, another good example of calling up the evens and odds question. Um, we're using three here, so yes, it is odd, but I'll show you how I like to do it. So turn, I'm going to do this kind of facing you so you can see. Um, so I'm going to put them in in a cluster, but I don't want to put them in like dot, dot, dot. I want them to be maybe one's higher, one's lower than um, something that we like to do, too, is in that. I mean, see, can you see how pretty this is? It's so nice. Um, something we really like to do is use them because they are carnations and, you know, we're not trying to be too in your face about it, but um, something that is nice to do is to cut them low and use them kind of as the inside. So they create this depth that you can, you don't necessarily really want to stare at a huge thing of carnations, but inside, once we layer something else on top of that, it really works well to kind of just fill the space. Uh, so from the carnations, uh, then I'm going to twist this, continue twisting, and we're going to, today's recipe calls for one of these orange chrysanthemums. Um, these, this variety is called, well, this style of chrysanthemum is called a cremone. Um, it's just a sort of fancy way of saying 
mum. So, you know, if you're a big mum, I guess that if you're trying to be kind of fancy. So when you're thinking about this color theory, you can see where now my orange side is really starting to develop here versus my purple side is really starting to develop. And, and like Carrie was saying with the color wheel, if you're imagining the orange and the purple on the color wheel and they're opposite each other, you want your like truest orange and your truest purple in this case to be opposite of each other in the vase. And then you're working those sort of bridge flowers in between the two. Um, let's see, what do I need next? Lysianthus and this one. Oh, you know, I have one here that I broke down, yeah. So this Lysianthus is probably the truest color of them all today, this really dark, vibrant purple. Um, you know, really beautiful. Again, not, not very likely that these will open. So if you feel that, you know, if you snap one, just go ahead and break it all the way off. Um, a lot of times we find like with our deliveries, it's these little things that will snap and transport too. So we tend to cut them off in the store so that they don't come to your door looking like they've been damaged because it's sort of inevitable that that like catches on the side of the box or something. So I'm gonna use this um, piece sort of concentrated like that rather than cutting it up and splitting it up. I'm gonna use one piece like that I'm gonna stick it in all the way and I'm gonna let that sort of create the base notes of the purple area. With these little laterals, I'm going to continue that idea, but just concentrate them again in that same area where they already are so that it really kind of gives that purple place a home, like all these ones go together. And I might even, some up high, not too high. The other thing you may know already, when you're first sort of starting out or getting started, a good way to do this and another reason to elevate your vase is you can hold the stem up to the side of the vase where you want it to go. And then it kind of gives you a guide of where to cut um, rather than like cutting blind. So you can always sort of gauge how you, how short to make it with that in mind as well. Another good use for these little shorties that kind of have been displaced is to just stick them from the top. Can you see from the top? Yeah, right. Um, just stick them all the way down in the center. And it seems, let me see if you can see that. Can you see it right down in there? It's like kind of seems wasted at first, but then you realize, well, no, if you're sitting at the table, you might see that actually, or as you're walking by and it's sitting on your coffee table, you will get an aerial view of the flowers at some point. And so creating that negative space, but not leaving it totally empty is kind of the goal with that. And another great way to do that is to use these little things that you've sort of cut off. That's just a perfect way to hide your mechanics. Um, so let's see, any questions so far? Yes. Yes, yeah, some good question. Will the mini carns open the same way? The, can you open them, manipulate them like the big ones? Is that yes, you can if they're sort of on their way there. See how much poop, like wider and poofier that one gets. These ones that are buds, not really. If you peel that off, it's not going to then just unfurl. It's kind of the same as these not blossoming. Sort of where they are when they get cut is where they stay so you can tell the ones that are already bigger the ones that are already big let me say it that way you can make bigger the ones that are sort of tight kind of stay that way so yes and no um let's see um see this and then the garden the roses right okay so i'm going to start with these standard roses these are the difference between standard and garden rose do we do you want to know about that yes um, okay, so standard rose is this shape and the, your more common variety. That's what you see daily in flower arranging. These are what you see when you see a red rose, a pink rose, things like that. This is a garden rose and you can see when you look at them side by side, a garden rose has a bigger head. It has a larger petal count. So when you look at them head on, you can see the huge difference there. Um, the Garden variety are the ones that now are the only ones you'll find with fragrance. The standard roses, the fragrance has been bred out of them for commercial growth. So you will never get a standard rose really that 
has a scent. You might, I shouldn't say never, but yeah, like really nothing out of this. And every now and then you'll, you can get a little bit, but it's um, unfortunately not these tonight, but the garden rose is the one that still has the scent left in it. Um, they're the more heirloom varieties. So they have the kind of names. This one's called country home. I like to just look at it and imagine that someday I'll have a country home and we can all go there. <laughs> um, so these have the sort of more sort of historical names and are the ones that you'll find named after people and things like that. They, this has the more traditional garden heritage. These are all just sort of commercially grown. Most of them come from South America or probably all of them come from South America. Um, your garden roses come more from Europe, Holland um, specifically. A few from South America as well, but mostly Holland, the garden roses. Um, another thing you can do with the rose is similar to the carnation. It seems a little sacrilegious, but if you put the rose kind of inside your, can you see what I'm doing? Sort of like massaging it. It's a little bit of a misnomer that these things are so gentle. I mean, they are fragile, but you can get a lot out of them if you just sort of practice. And again, it just sort of comes with practice in that hand feel, but you can see the difference. Um, this is, you know, how it would eventually get in your vase, but why wait three days, right? When you can get it like that on the first day. So, um, you know, another thing to note too, is that all the flowers come with these petals that are a little darker. A lot of times they're green or they'll have some weird color variety variants there. These are called guard petals. They're intended to be taken off. If you get an arrangement from a shop and sometimes these get left on, it happens, you know, they kind of look like they're a little bit messed up, they're rough, like whatever. They're meant to be taken off and the real true flower underneath starts to come out. They're just a built in, you know, nature's mechanism of preserving the flower. Um, a lot of times when we're getting things out of the boxes because they've come internationally, uh -oh. Hold on. There we go. Because they've come through international customs, they'll take like a long knife or like a box cutter and they just poke through the boxes to make sure that there's nothing else in those boxes coming through customs. And so it's not uncommon for us to see like knife cuts in the um, guard petals because, and then that's them doing their job, right? So this, this gets preserved and you just peel those guard petals away. Um, okay, so I'm going to add these three roses in, in our store, we think of these as face flowers. The garden roses are obviously the face, the main face flower. So you're gonna put, I tend to use them in the vase kind of with these, but then this on top of it to kind of make this stand out a little bit more. I mean, it already does, but just even more. And so then this is back to the question of the evens versus odds. Um, we're gonna use three of these and then only two of these but I'll show you how we'll use them to where they look uh, harmonious, even as an even number. Um, oh, we're, okay, perfect. So I'm gonna put these on. They're gonna go all with the orange side, obviously. And because like this lysianthus, this is the most saturated of the orange colors. This is really gonna be our like orange moment here. Um, and I'm going to use them in three different sort of heights here. There's no real question now what side is orange or what side is purple. And see where I have this carnation and I really like it there, but I think I like this more. So I'm gonna just take this and swap it out. And I'm, I'll find a different use for this, which will probably go down low and in the middle to kind of fill that negative space. And I'll stick this here. Nope, maybe, yeah, stick that there to feature it. So then now to answer about the twos versus the threes, you can see here, while I have the three standards, and that does create a more harmonious true center, spreading these out and using them as opposites has that same effect without, as long as you're not kind of using them like this, it sort of doesn't matter if you have evens or odds. Did I get everything in there? 
Yeah, right. So the last bit is just this gestural bit. And with that, we're going to add dahlias. Um, are those gestures or face? This is an example too of where things kind of cross over. Like I was saying before, if your dahlias came in huge, they'd be your face flower. If they come in sort of slight like this and slender, then this is, how cool is this? Like this is more of a gestural flower. So let the sort of shape that they already have inform how you put them in your vase. Um, to that end, you know, this dahlias especially are super, uh, delicate and slight, light, slender. So, you know, we're never kind of shy about little failure here. I'm just gonna pull that off. This is how they appear in nature, right? So um, I'm going to add these in because they have that same kind of mob, like mauve quality as this. They're gonna play nicely closer to the purple flowers. And then because they are so spectacular, they are so seasonal, as I see this and I think, okay, well, this very lovely, but I mean, it's no Dahlia, right? So let's cut her down a little. Yeah, and then we'll give that, <laughs> Carrie just said cutthroat, she's right. Give that like a better stage to shine. Don't also be afraid to switch it up. Like I'm realizing maybe that's not the best spot for that. So will this work? Am I in the base? Yes. Cut that down a little even more maybe to like let the dahlia really sing. There we go. And now I'm gonna add these last two elements here for the purple. And this is another example of this like texture that we just are addicted to basically. Um, this is called scabiosa, unfortunate name sort of, but very beautiful flower. Comes in a lot of these same sort of jewelry toned purples and pinks. Um, these now, these will open. If you, if this whole arrangement goes and you still have the scabiosas, I would say pull these out because I have given this a test where I've like let these just stay in a vase and almost every single one of these will open. No, not every time, but see this versus that these can get all the way fully around. I've seen them do that. So maybe hold on to those if you can. Um, I'm gonna use these, even though they are gesture, I'm gonna use these a little bit differently with the high and low because they're big enough where you can really fill in some space with them as well. So I might look to use these in more of a face flower way. I can't really do this one handed. Um, you know, not everything follows one rule. So I, you know, I just like that one there. So these are gonna go in. These come to us with these little, can you see these little clear necks, collars? We leave them on, you don't have to, but something like this, once that thing fully opens, it will be sort of top heavy. Um, if it's not offensive looking, I say leave it on. There, you know, you just, again, everything you can do to get longer base life, I'm all about that. So I'm um, gonna stick these in. And then the last element that we have today in this recipe is allium, which uh, for you vegetable gardeners may know already as an onion. Um, these are very cool, very fun texture, not a very nice smell. They do smell like onions, um, but you know, worth it for the, textural variety I think you get. So I'm gonna use one over here because it belongs with its family of purples, but then I am going to put one over here to kind of call back to the purple side on the orange side and kind of just stick it down low to be sort of like a counterpoint to this. So now as I, that's the whole recipe. And now as I inspect the vase, I see, okay, like this and this are a nice counterpoint. I see that this, and this are a nice counterpoint, and that this and this are a nice counterpoint, and that my eye is looking all the way around this. I wanna see something, some, there's something to see every place that you turn the arrangement. And that is really because of how we use the colors in the base. Um, any questions? <laughs> That's okay. No, it takes, it takes practice. I, I mean, it's, 
we're here to help you. It takes a lot of practice. Um, it's just to get, it's just to, to show you a way to think about it differently. So, you know, if, if you don't do it this way, you know, maybe it might be easier starting out with just these colors. Maybe that's how you start. You start with just using tones of the same color. That might be an easier way to approach it. Um, or this might, like, this is a better example. Maybe you just start out using tones of different colors. Um, you know, this is kind of just to show you the big, the like full idea in the base. But yeah, so this is the look. This is um, our sort of method. This is our, I, I don't know, signature, I guess. Um, I and, think it deserves a round of applause. Yeah. <laughs> So that is, that's us. That's sort of what we strive to do each day. The colors always change. The shapes always change because, you know, your season is changing, your base is changing, your availability is changing. But that same recipe and the same method, it, it's like no fail. Yes. Um, would it be easier to use a color wheel as you're making the arrangement? I mean, I guess that's up to you, really. W what really informs the things that we buy is what's available. So, you know, a color wheel is great, but if they don't have orange that day, then it doesn't matter if I want to use it, right? So, I mean, you can go in your garden and see, this is what I have to choose from, and then use that color wheel, I guess, to see what goes together best. But you don't have, you shouldn't be like a slave to it. The idea is to make them look more natural, not create more work for yourself. Does that, does that answer? Okay, anything else? Sorry about this. No other questions? You wanna get started? All right, All right let's do it. All right, you're not gonna do the other. I, I think time-wise, yeah. I should, okay. right? All right, cool. Um, so before you get started, um, just give me one second. I'm gonna, um, I, you know, I'm contractually required to give you some promotional material. Um, otherwise, I'm not doing my job. So um, before you get up and go, um, I do want to um, let you know that uh, Daughter's Flower Shop is right around the corner. Go visit them. Um, go check out their website. Um, you know, I think uh, you've seen a great example of the kind of work that they do. So um, once again, let's uh, give them a round of applause. Great, and then I'm gonna just gonna tell you about a couple of things. Our open house is next week. Um, we really wanna see all of you. So please come October 21st, four to 7 p.m. We're gonna be mostly out in the uh, um, courtyard and hopefully it's going to be a beautiful um, early evening. And uh, we really wanna see you. It's a great way to celebrate, to get together. And uh, we'll have lots of uh, information about all the programs that are coming up here. And uh, we're also going to unveil our new Carolyn Lindsay Library, um, which was donated to us. Um, so that's worth seeing just in and of itself. We'll have some drinks, we'll have some hors d'oeuvres. It'll be great. Um, we, the Garden Club, are organizing the horticulture show for the Greater Jacksonville Agricultural Fair. This is brand new for us. We've never done it before. Um, it's a big deal for us. And um, so uh, we need you to participate. And we also want you to come and check it out. So uh, if you have a plant that you love or plants, multiple plants, um, think about entering. Um, go to our website and check out the blog post. Um, there's a call for entries. There's 14 different categories. You probably have one of these plants in your home right now. Um, and you can enter it at the fair and, uh, and have some bragging rights. You can win a really cool ribbon and there's even some cash prizes. It's kind of cool. Um, so check it out. Um, this is an example of the uh, call for entries. And so you can see there's everything in here from um, African violets to uh, succulents and everything in between. Uh, we have our budding gardeners program. The next one is coming up in uh, November. We're partner partnering with um, White Harvest Farms, which is part of Clara White Mission. And uh, so we'll be going, growing some veggies. You'll get to take some veggies home. Um, so if you have a child that's in uh, early uh, grade school, bring them. And we'll also have a taste test of uh, some vegetables that uh, Clara White Mission will be cooking up. And uh, next couple of horticulture programs, we have House Plants and Health with Talitha Smith Green, um, who has a beautiful store and uh, really focuses on the well being that plants can bring you into your home. Uh, we're also working with Claire, um, with White Harvest Farms on this program. Uh, they have uh, done a lot of work in soil health. And uh, so if you want to grow better vegetables, better plants, really focus on the health of your soil. Don't treat the symptom, treat the, you know, the, the, you know, what it's coming out of and you'll grow beautiful things just like these carrots that you see here which are from white harvest farms 
Uh, in February, we have uh, Bird Habitats. Jody Willis from the Duval Audubon Society is going to do a great program talking about how you can grow groceries for your birds in your backyard. And uh, birds are uh, one of the key um, species. Like if we take care of birds, it takes care of a lot of other um, organisms out there. And uh, we're selling pecans. It's time for ordering pecans. Uh, if you order them now through the end of the month, they will come um, around the last week of November, just in time for the holidays. All right, and we're gonna um, send you a survey uh, that uh, asked you what you thought of this program. We really wanna get your opinion. It's important to us. We need to know that we are serving you. And uh, there'll also be a place where you can tell us what kind of programs you wanna see in the future. And so please fill up the survey. We really appreciate it. I wanna thank the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund one more time for making programs like this possible. And I wanna thank all of you for being here. I wanna thank our speakers once again. And if you, you know, we can do programs like this, but if you're not here, what's the point? Like, you know, we'd be talking to ourselves. So really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. And now it's time for you to go and find your recipe. There are buckets of all the flowers that you need. So they're spread out, um, but follow your recipe. Um, try to stick to that because we don't want to uh, run out of flowers, okay? Um, we do have self-serve um, sodas, water, wine um, over there. If you do partake, we wouldn't mind a donation. Thank you. Appreciate it. Have a great evening, everyone.